Institute for Bhakti Sustain Bhakti Vaibhav. I'm actually personally his student and he's taking his guidance a lot from the Bhakti Sustain Bhakti Vaibhav. So please dear devotees, if you can switch on the video, that will be good to live for the interaction to Maharaj as well. And please uh, wait for Maharaj's instruction when you have actually raised their hand. So please raise your hand first before asking the question. So Maharaj. Okay. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Okay. Om Magyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Precharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Vancha Kaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So welcome to all of you, to this Bhakti Bhai Bhav. This is the final unit of this part of the first part of the Bhakti Bhai Bhav. And we're finishing the third canto with Kapila Shiksha. Right? Beginning today, chapter number 25. So, who taught the last unit? His Grace was Prabhu. Srivas Prabhu, okay. So you were hearing, you heard all about Devahuti and Kardama Muni. It's, a, it's appropriate for a Grihastha to teach that section. <laughs> a little difficult for sannyasis to deal with that. Okay, I have a PowerPoint. We'll go into the PowerPoint here. Let me see. I have a PowerPoint somewhere. Are you able to see the PowerPoint? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Okay, good. All right, so this final section, uh, Kapila Shiksha, glorification of Srimad Bhagavatam. Let's read it a little bit from Krishna Lila Stava by Sanatan Goswami. O Srimad Bhagavatam, O nectar, churn from the ocean of all scriptures, you are the most prominent transcendental fruit of the Vedas, enriched with the jewel of all conclusive truths. You grant spiritual vision to all the people of the world. O life breath of the Vaishnava devotees, O Lord, you are the sun which has arisen to dispel the darkness of Kali Yuga. You are actually Lord Krishna who has returned among us. O Srimad Bhagavatam, I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. By your recitation one attains transcendental bliss because your syllable shower pure love of God upon the reader. You are always to be served by everyone, for you are an incarnation of Lord Krishna. 
O Srimad Bhagavatam, O my only friend, O my companion, O my teacher, O my great wealth, O my deliverer, O my good fortune, O my bliss, I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. O Srimad Bhagavatam, O bestower of saintliness to the unsaintly, O uplifter of the most fallen, Please don't ever leave me. Accompanied by pure love of Krishna, please manifest yourself in my heart and in my throat. All right. Thank you, Srila Sanatana Goswami, for these wonderful verses glorifying Srimad Bhagavatam. All right. So we're going to be going from chapter 25 up to chapter 33. You've covered already Devahuti and Kadama, and you've heard about the appearance of Lord Kapila in the previous unit. And now we're going into the actual Shiksha of Lord Kapila. So chapter 25, which is the chapter which Prabhupada lectured on, and you may have, of course, I assume you've already seen the book, Teachings of Lord Kapila. That's there. It's all classes taken from... Prabhupada's lectures on the 25th chapter. The 25th chapter emphasizes the path of bhakti. Chapter 26 goes on to talk about jnana, and we'll see the analytical study of the elements of the material world. Jnana, Sankhya. And 27 deals with liberation of the jnani. 28, we'll hear about Astanga Yoga, and then 29, Bhakti in the Modes, and pure Bhakti, an important chapter. This whole section, very important, very powerful, very many, many important verses come up in the course of this Kapila Shiksha. And then we go on, chapter 30, because what happens if we don't even follow karma yoga, the result of action in the gunas. So we hear about the modes of nature. Chapter 30 describes tamas, 31 tamas and rajas, 32 rajas and sattva, and 33 we'll hear about Devahuti's bhakti and how she gets her perfection, what happens to her after getting Lord Kapila's shiksha. All right. So we're going to go through chapter 25 today. Here you can see the very nice artistic impression. Lord Kapila preaching to his mother, Devahuti. <laughs> very nice, wonderful artistic representation of Lord Kapila giving his shiksha to Mother Devahuti. <laughs> uh, Devamrita Swami Devamrita Swami was describing, he said he went home <laughs> and his mother is like a fundamental Christian. <laughs> and so his mother must have been looking at his books or something. And what happened, he said he was sitting at home and she, she came and sat on the floor in front of him and, and said to him, is this how it's supposed to be? Is this how you do it? <laughs> you know, she was his mother. And so she was taking the role of Devahuti. <laughs> so, like that. Lord Kapila instructing Devahuti. The different sections of the chapter. Let's go through the introduction first of all. We'll hear about the, what happened, how it came about. Lord Kapila's got the opportunity to give this shiksha to Devahuti. Then we'll hear Devahuti put her questions, and then Lord Kapila will begin to explain Sankhya Yoga. Sankhya Yoga is essentially jnana along with meditation. So that's why you've got the jnana and you've got the astanga. Astanga Yoga is actually the meditation part. And we'll hear about the supreme, how bhakti is above all the other processes. 
And we'll hear about the importance of the association with the sadhu, that from that association opens the doors to devotional service. Then more questions by Devahuri, and the Lord will describe Sankhya as a combination of bhakti and yoga. Okay, so connection with the previous chapter. There's Kardama Muni going off to take sannyas. Well, I, I'm sure it's not going to be like Tridandi sannyas, you know, but he's going to renounce. You can see he's already quite renounced. He's got the big beard. By nature, he was renounced. He'd been living as a brahmachari for a long time before he got married, before Devahuti came. And after the children were born, after the daughters came, and then the daughters they're given in marriage, and the son is left. So Lord Kardama Muni leaves Lord Kapila to take care of his wife. So Shona Karishi, the leader of the sages at Naimisharanya, desires to hear about the activities of Lord Kapila and his instructions on Sankhya philosophy. Sankhya philosophy. This is one of the six important philosophies, one of the six darshans. There are six different philosophical systems, right, mentioned in the Vedas. You've got the Karma Mimamsa by Jaimini, and you've got this Sankhya, and you've got also Patanjali Yoga, and you've got Gotama's Logic, and then you've got Vedanta from Vyasadeva, and then you've got also the impersonal philosophy. Uh, so six different philosophical systems, Sattarshans. And this Sankhya philosophy is one of them, but unfortunately, generally, people only know about the atheistic Kapila. The Devahuti Kapila is not so well known, and it's only by Prabhupada's grace that we have the Srimad Bhagavatam, and he's explaining to us what is actually the Sankhya philosophy taught by Lord Kapila, the son of Devahuti. So Sutta Goswami continues this conversation. He's describing how it was explained by Maitreya to Vidura. Text number one. Sri Shonika said, although he is unborn, the Supreme Personality of Godhead took birth as Kapila Muni by his internal potency. He descended to disseminate transcendental knowledge for the benefit of the whole human race. So Shonika is descri describing Lord Kapila. He understands Lord Kapila is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He is unborn. Right? Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Ajopisanabhyayatma, Bhutanam Ishvaropi. Although I'm unborn and my transcendental body never deteriorates, I still appear in every millennium. So similarly, Lord Kapila, he appears by his internal potency and his mission and purpose to, just, to give transcendental knowledge, to deliver us with the teaching of the Sankhya philosophy. It's meant to save us from materialistic life. So Maitreya is describing to Vidura and he says, when Kardama left for the forest, Lord Kapila stayed on the strand of the Bindu Sarova to please his mother Devahuti. When Kapila, who could show her the ultimate goal of the Absolute Truth was sitting leisurely before her, 
Devahuti remembered the words Brahma had spoken to her, and she therefore began to question Kapila as follows. All right, so Kardama Muni, he leaves Lord Kapila with the, in charge of his wife. That's sannyas, he's taking, he's not vanapras, he's taking sannyas, he leave the wife. And he's going off, he said like that, after we have a son, then I will re renounce. So the son came and Kardama understood, now I have to go. And he left Lord Kapila to take care of his good wife Devahuti. So Lord Kapila knows he's the Supreme Personality of Godhead. It had already been told to Devahuti like this. Lord Brahma had told her that you will have a child who is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So the divine nature of her son was already told her even before the child appeared. Lord Brahma had told her. And so Devahuti, remember Devahuti is a very enlightened lady. She is the, the daughter of Swayambhuvamanu. And Swayambhuvamanu is one of the Mahajans. He's also a great soul. So Devahuti came from a great family, which has wonderful qualities. And although her husband's gone away and left her, she's able to approach her son to take advantage of her son and to put questions to him. And we're going to hear what are her questions. Devahuti, inquiring from Kapila. Devahuti said, I am very sick of the disturbance caused by my material senses. For because of this sense disturbance, my Lord, I have fallen into the abscess of ignorance. This is a very good situation for somebody who is serious about spiritual life. We're very to be very sick of the disturbance of the senses, to understand how the senses are giving us so much disturbance, and how because of these senses we become so ignorant, we become so attached to the body, we become so absorbed in thoughts of sense gratification. So Devahuti, she'd had a lot of sense gratification, She'd been traveling with her husband everywhere. They'd been enjoying and they'd had their children. And, but now it's all over. It's all finished with. So she can understand the temporary nature of sense gratification. And she understood that this demands of the senses, this is all her ignorance. And she, she wants to understand what to do, how to overcome this ignorance. All right? We're in ignorance, what to do about it, how to get cured. And she said, I'm sick, right? So you're sick, you're not healthy, you want to become healthy. How do we come, become healthy? Therefore, she's approaching Lord Kapila. She wants to hear, what is the cure? for her material disease. Srila Prabhupada's purport explains, we should know that beyond these temporary senses are our permanent senses, which are now covered by the material body. Eternal sensory activities are called devotional service, whereas temporary sensory activities are called sense gratification. Srila Prabhupada is explaining to us what is the situation. There is sense gratification 
and there is devotional service. Different levels of senses. Beyond the temporary senses, we have our permanent senses, our pure spiritual senses, but they're covered by the material body. We can remove the covering by devotional service. But there's two levels we have to remember. There's the material, there's the spiritual. There's sense gratification and there's devotional service. Unless one becomes very tired of material sense gratification, there is no opportunity to hear transcendental messages from a person like Kapila. Devahuti expressed that she was tired. Now that her husband had left home, she wanted to get relief by hearing the instruction of Lord Kapila. Yeah, it's interesting. Devahuti is not thinking, Oh, he's gone. Maybe I should get another husband. <laughs> She's not thinking like that, thank goodness. Nowadays, you know, today in Kali Yuga, it's, it become, it's become like that. The, the, the husband goes, the wife says, Oh, find another man. But Devahuti, she's had enough of sense gratification. It's very important. You have, we, have to have, we have to be tired of sense gratification. It means we have no more interest in sense gratification. Then we can be eager to hear from the transcendentalists like Lord Kapila. So Devahuti was, in some ways, it was a good fortune for her. Her distress, the, her husband leaving home, Initially it's distress, but it becomes pleasure, it becomes a good thing for her, because now she's able to actually take fully to spiritual life. She's had her sense gratification, it's finished with. Right? Varnashram is like that. Brahmachari training, grihastha life, then renunciation. You don't remain and grihastha life. Successful family life is to move on into detachment. The qualification for hearing. Very important that when we're preaching we want to have a receptive person to hear. So what is the qualification for hearing? This is from the sixth canto. Angira, a great sage, is instructing Maharaj Chitraketu. And he says, when I first came to your home, I could have given you the supreme transcendental knowledge. But when I saw that your mind was absorbed in material things, I gave you only a son who caused you jubilation and lamentation. So Angira Muni is describing, he says, when I came I, I could have given you transcendental knowledge, but I saw you were not ready, you didn't want it. You just wanted the son. You were so attached to having the son. So you got the son. And the sun caused you jubilation, but then also lamentation. So now, of course, Chitraketu was ready to hear from Angira. After the lamentation, the distress, that distress is like a qualification for hearing. We know in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes four kinds of people who come to him for instruction. Right? One is in distress. Prabhupada said most of his disciples, they all came in distress. The nature of material life 
so much distress. Nobody is happy in this material world. So this is a qualification for hearing. So we have a question for you, a little exercise for you. Share your realizations of sit situations in your life when you became more serious about self-realization. How many people do we have here today in the class? 47 Maharaj. How many? 47. Oh my goodness, so many. Is it possible? Uh, well, maybe we'll just take some contributions because it would take so long to make groups. Uh, maybe since this is a, a short exercise, maybe we can just ask some people to contribute directly and we'll hear as a whole, a whole class. We'll just have a class, yes. class discussion, right? Someone would like to tell us about situations in your life when you became more serious about self-realization? There are two devotees is raising their hand, Maharas. Okay. Radha Savika Mataji. Yes. Yes, Radha Savika Mataji, please. Sita Takurani Mataji. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Tendrit Pradam. Hare Krishna. Uh, I, I just want to share my uh, little realization. Uh, a year back, I get uh, I got accident. I was chanting and were a very new devotee. So I, I, I just fractured on my leg and uh, badly hurt. But uh, only the thinking, I'm, uh, because I am new and I just heard about the chanting, so I'm just regretting you. why cannot I have finished my round, then I can came out, because anything has happened. So after that incident, I become more serious that uh, whatever the consequences, first I finish my 16th round, then I have to go out for any work or anything. Because uh, chanting is very important for us. So this way, I can take it very seriously, Maharaj. All right. Thank you, Maharaj. So you, you think if you chanted your rounds first, you may not have got the accident? No, it's not like that. Consequences will come, but I couldn't chant. And if I die, then what will happen? This was a demand. Oh. <laughs> yeah, if you leave the body, you want to finish your rounds before you leave the body, right? Yes, Maharaj, because we are not so pure. At least we can do 16 round it. There is some hope for us. Yes. <laughs> right, hope for us. Okay. Thank you, Maharaji. Another person had their hand raised. Hare Krishna, um, Maharaj. Um, I um, was more interested, I think, in trying to find out about Krishna consciousness after the death of a loved one. Um, I think that whole process just kind of shook me because the person was a Vaishnava and um, I think I, 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 until that point um, I wasn't so serious but after yeah, he passed away I was, um, yeah, I was more serious and I could see Krishna's hand in so many things as well so um, it kind of pushed me towards being more um, serious. You were already a devotee? Like, uh, we, like, yeah, not a devotee as such, but I, I'm born in like Hindu family, so yeah, we was aware of Krishna, um, and yes, I mean, I wouldn't say a devotee, but um, yeah, practicing uh, to some degree, yeah. Okay, you've been to the temple. Uh, yeah, yeah, a few times. Um, I had, to, yeah, I was always, um, yeah, like I. Like I always knew Krishna's God and, and all those kind of things, but I wasn't, I was still more interested. I won't say moment, yeah, I was more concerned about just the every day to day um, dealings of life. Uh -huh. um, uh, just, yeah, I wasn't, I won't say I was so interested. And then 
I was quite fortunate actually because I got to go to lots of places of pilgrimage um, oh. and um, after I lost the, 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 my per the person I think I was at a point in my life where everything just it was like okay what's it all about because um, he, he used to read the Bhagavad Gita um, like on every day um, and he was he was he, yeah he was the person that actually it was my granddad so it was he was the person that kind of um, uh, yeah, brought us in contact from from when we were kids. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. Very nice. It, it, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so. Thank you very much for sharing with us this. All right. So certainly, these kind of experiences they can be a real catalyst to our spiritual life. It can really be a boost for us, although it it seems like a disaster initially, but. The disaster can be like the threshold into the spiritual life, that we become very serious, we take self-realization much more seriously. So it's like that for Devahuti, certainly Devahuti is in this situation, losing her husband. All right, so Devahuti's inquiry from Kapila, what did she ask him? Text 7 to 11, dispel my illusion due to my false ego and created by your own maya. Explain about Prakriti and Purusha. Prakriti and Purusha, of course, this is an ongoing topic in Bhagavad Gita. Krishna also spoke about Prakriti and Purusha. Came in the fifth chapter, then it comes again in the thirteenth chapter. It comes like the a big topic, Prakriti, the material nature, and Purusha, the the Supreme Lord, and other Purushas are those who are trying trying to be the Supreme Lord, the living entities who think they are the Lord. They are also like Purushas. So Devahuti wants to understand these things. <clears throat> Sankhya philosophy, as is well known, deals with Prakriti and Purush. Purush is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, or anyone who imitates the Supreme Personality of Godhead as an enjoyer. And Prakriti means nature. In this material world, material nature is being exploited by the Purushas, or the living entities. The, in, the intricacies in the material world of the relationship of the Prakriti and Purusha or the enjoyer and the enjoy is called samsar or material entanglement. We ask you, explain why Devahuti said my engagement in sense gratification was also due to you. Think about it. Devahuti is saying to Lord Kapila, my engagement in sense gratification was also due to you. What does she mean? Yes, Maharaji. Tartavatana Maharaji. Uh, I think it's because Devauti was uh, sincerely serving Kardama Muni, but Kardama Muni only asked for a benediction and wanted to give some facilities, and uh, that's why, Maharaj. Tell me again. Uh, I'm. Uh, can you hear me, Maharaj? Yes. Yeah, I just want to okay. hear, hear it again clearly. Okay. So, um, actually, Devahuti was uh, completely in the service of Kardama Muni without asking any benefits, fully surrendered. But Kardama Muni only being pleased to Devahuti, uh, asked for some material, even benediction, like he gave the facilities and he took her to many places. And that's why, Maharaj? <laughs> well, uh, there's a deeper reason, 
when she's talking about this, that her engagement in sense gratification was due to you, that she understands the identity of Lord Kapila. That Lord Kapila, is, she's not just thinking of him as her son, but she knows he's the Supreme Lord. And ultimately, the Supreme Lord is the controller of everyone. He's, he's the supreme controller. He's in our heart and he directs us, of course, according to our own desires. We have a quote here explaining, The Lord is merciful. If anyone wants to forget him and enjoy this material world, he gives full facility, not directly, but through the agency of the material potency. Therefore, since the material potency is the Lord's energy, indirectly it is the Lord who gives the facility to forget him. Devahuti therefore said, my engagement in sense gratification was also due to you. Now kindly get me free from this entanglement. Right? The material nature, of course, material nature acts under the control of the Supreme Lord. It's under the control of Lord, of Lord Kapila. And the material nature, the material potency, it, it, it appears to be responsible for Devahuti's sense gratification, but ultimately that material nature is directed by the Supreme Lord. And so Tevahuti is saying that, uh, yeah, I've, I've been engaged in sense gratification and you allowed it, now you have to help me get free from this entanglement. This is the nature, the material world. Krishna is in our heart, he knows our desires. He knows what we think, what we desire, what we want. He arranges for it. We get the result. We say, Ishwara Parama Krishna, right? He's the supreme controller. So it's indirectly through, the, through Lord Krishna, it's facilitated by the material nature. Is that all right? Yes, Maharaj. Okay. Yes, somebody has a question? Anybody? Thank you, Shah Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. Dhandra Prana Maharaj. This is Yadraj, uh, Krishna Das from Taipei, Malaysia Maharaj. Hmm. Maharaj, uh, regarding uh, just now, where Devahuti said that, uh, that uh, the Lord is a cause uh, for her sense gratification, but uh, so it's a big contradict with uh, free will because uh, Lord only facilitates our free will. So because our free will is such gratification, the Lord gave the facility. So it's not that uh, Lord gave facility and then we use make use of that facility to enjoy our sense gratification. So I am not be able to understand Devoti's uh, statement here, Maharaj. Maybe Mara can clarify it a bit because they would be saying that is is the Lord who caused the, her to enjoy the sense gratification. So by actually is Jiva's desire to enjoy where the Lord fulfilled. So it's a big contradiction. So can Mara clarify that? Well, yeah. The, initially, it's the Jiva's desire. Yeah, and the Lord understands the desire of the living entity, and He arranges for it through the material nature. So the living entity has that right to in, a desire. Devahuti is saying, you, you, <laughs> it was due to you. You know, she's saying, you shouldn't have allowed me to have all that sense gratification. So she's not understood the nature of the living entity. The, the living entity does have that free will and the Lord facilitates. He knows the desire of the living entity, so she, he, he facilitates it. So Devahuti is, you know, she's saying it's your fault. They said, you arranged for my sense gratification. 
So you should, now you should arrange for me to get this enlightenment. I think it's quite reasonable. Devahuti's changed her desire. Now she's desiring enlightenment. Previously she desired sense gratification. The Lord arranged it. And now she's telling Lord Kapila, that now I want enlightenment. You should arrange this. So that means, Maharaj, uh, initially devotee was in uh, ignorance, little ignorance, that's why she enjoys sanctification, but now she is alive, that she wants uh, enlightenment. Is that how we can understand, Maharaj? Yes. Like that. Okay, she's come, okay, you know, you. she's had her sense gratification, she's tired of it, she's seen through the, gl the glitter of the sense gratification, she's had enough of it, she's put it aside, now she wants to focus on enlightenment, the goal of life. Okay, thank you, Maharaj. Okay. Going ahead, Lord Kapila is going to speak about the yoga system, some of the main points here. Yoga adhyatmika pumsam, related to the Lord and the individual souls. And then Nishriya Shaya, meant for bestowing the highest benefit on everyone. Makes one indifferent to all so-called happiness and distress in this material world and serviceable and practical in every way. So some of the highlights of this yoga system. First of all, it, the, the Supreme Lord is there and the individual living entities. Not that, it's all, not that we're all one. There's a distinction between the Lord and the individual souls. So it's a personal philosophy meant for giving the highest benefit, this is spiritual, material benefits are all temporary, limited, highest benefit is eternal. Indifferent to all so-called happiness and distress in the material world. We should certainly become indifferent. To become indifferent to all this happiness and distress, we have to understand our proper nature as spiritual beings and serviceable and practical in every way. Practical, it should be practical. Krishna consciousness is very serviceable and practical. So many processes, that they're just not practical. What you have to do, so many strange things you have to do. Or you have to go away from the world, you have to do so many unusual things. So, the yoga system has to be serviceable and practical. The acharyas adjust these things, just like Srila Prabhupada, as the founder Acharya, he established the principles of Krishna consciousness. What should be the principles? How many rounds to chant? Everything, every, everything is serviceable and practical. He didn't ask too much. He just asked what was good for us that we can get the ultimate benefit. So this is the yoga system Lord Kapila described. And we see how Srila Prabhupada also in founding the Krishna consciousness movement gives us the same benefit. Essence of Sankhya, yoga concerning the Jivatma, Adhyatmika, is approved as the most beneficial method for oneself, Nishraya It has three types, Bhakti, Jnana and Astanga Yoga. For Bhakti, benefit for oneself is a secondary effect. Being situated in this yoga, one uproots material happiness and distress. So this, this Sankhya Yoga system is a combination of this Bhakti, Jnana and Astanga Yoga. Today chapter 25 is on Bhakti, tomorrow we'll see the Jnana and then later on the Astanga Yoga, 
also. Astanga Yoga is not just asanas, but it's the meditation, the concentration on the Lord. So, the bhakti part is being discussed here. Srila Prabhupada lectured, we said, on the bhakti part. And, but this benefit for oneself is a secondary effect. The primary effect, that's the meditation on the Lord, the Gyan and the uh, Astanga. This is Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's commentary on this section. So the goal of Sankhya, to transfer one's consciousness, one's attachment from matter to spirit, from the body as oneself to the devotional service of the Lord. So this is quite reasonable, just like in our own process. Transfer one's consciousness, attachment from matter to spirit, from the body to the self, to the devotional service of the Lord. First of all, we have to distinguish between matter and spirit, Krishna consciousness and Maya consciousness. Someone just asked me t today, uh, they read the book Bhagavad Gita and they read about surrendering to Krishna and accepting Krishna as, as surrendering to Krishna and give up everything and take shelter of him. And they said why they should do that. And so they had not read the initial part of the Bhagavad Gita. They hadn't made the distinction between matter and spirit. They had not understood the difference between Krishna consciousness and Maya consciousness. So how can someone surrender to Krishna without understanding their own identity? So we have to be able to distinguish between what is matter and what is spirit. This is the beginning of the Sankhya philosophy, the beginning of the yoga process. And then we go on, we should understand that the mind, chaitas, is the cause of bondage and liberation for the jiva. Attachment to the gunas causes bondage, but attraction for the Lord causes liberation. So after understanding that we're not the body, that we're soul, then we should understand the nature of the mind and how it's the cause, how we become entangled in this material world. All the attachments which are there, they keep us in this material consciousness. But if we can change the attraction to Krishna or to the Supreme Lord, that can give us liberation. With this understanding, we must purify our consciousness through devotional service, so that we can stop identifying ourselves as enjoyers and controllers and become situated in our constitutional position as Krishna's servants. Right? So this purification of the consciousness, understanding we are the servant. By practice of knowledge and renunciation and devotional service, one sees everything in the right perspective, becomes indifferent to material existence and the material energy acts less powerfully on him. So practice of knowledge and renunciation. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu gave great importance to these things. That was appreciated by Sarvabhuma Bhattacharya. He glorified Lord Chaitanya. Huh? Vairagya Vidya Nija Bhakti Yoga Shikshata Eka Purusha Purana. Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya wrote a very powerful verse about Lord Chaitanya that he has appeared to teach us devotional service enriched with knowledge and detachment or renunciation. So these things are directly connected with devotional service. Where there is actual devotional service, there, would, there must be also knowledge and renunciation or jnana and vairagya. So these things, they, actually, they must follow where there's real bhakti. 
And then you become less interested in the material world and the material energy has less effect. So Lord Kapila is saying, perfection and self-realization cannot be attained by any kind of yogi unless he engages in devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That is the only auspicious path. So this is the authoritative statement. You have to engage in yoga, devotional service. Lord Kapila is encouraging Devahuti. You have to do devotional service. And then he goes on to say, every learned man knows very well Attachment for the material is the greatest entanglement of the spirit soul. But that same attachment, when applied to self-realized devotees, opens the door to liberation. So, of course, Lord Kapila is giving this instruction to Devahuti. He's telling her, you know, you're, you're so attached to sense gratification, you're thinking about your husband, your sense gratification, but you have to change that attachment. You have to become attached to the sadhu. You have to become attached to the devotee, to the holy man. So you have to change that. It's not wrong to be attached. It's the nature of the senses and the mind that we're going to find attachments. If we're not attached to Krishna, we become attached to cats and dogs. We become attached to motor cars and computers and handphones. We become attached to the material world. So we have to change the attachment and we have to become attached to the self-realized devotees. You have to find that devotee you can be attached to. So. How do we know who is that devotee? We have to recognize the qualities. We have to look. The symptoms. Lord Kapila tells us, what are the symptoms of the sadhu? So many different things are mentioned. First of all, the tolerance, the mercy, friends to all creatures, no enemies, peaceful, follow scriptures, Sadhu Bhushana, all his qualities are the ornaments of the sadhu. Sadhava Sadhu Bhushana, all his characteristics are sublime. So these qualities of the sadhu, very important. So we ask you a little application for you. Select some qualities of a sadhu which you find particularly inspiring and discuss your plan to further develop these qualities in yourself. All right? So we'll give you a few minutes to think about this. You can, if you have somebody with you, you can discuss with them. But makes, write down some qualities, some particular qualities of a sadhu mentioned in these verses, 21 to 24, which you are inspired by. And then tell us, how are you going to develop these qualities yourself? You understand? Okay, I'll give you five minutes. Write down some things.
All right? Some devotees ready to give feedback? Are you able to hear me, Maharaj? Yes, who are you? Uh, this, my name is Leela Mai Rukmini Devidasi. Okay. Um, yeah, the qualities that uh, I just picked two qualities that I would like to develop. Uh, one is to be friendly to all living entities, and the other one is to be peaceful. Um, so, in order to be peaceful, um, I think uh, I need to take more responsibility for my own actions and not uh, put the blame on others because when I blame others, then I get angry and uh, um, it uh, spoils the relationship and uh, um, because of that, uh, you know, there is strain and all that. But if I can take responsibility for my own actions, then um, I can be more, uh, uh, think about why things went wrong and be more conscious of what I'm doing. And uh, I think it's also important for me to be more friendly to people. So I want to develop the quality of uh, tolerance, uh, be able to listen more patiently to what people are saying and uh, see how I can do something to help them um, rather than trying to say, you know, you did this wrong or you did that wrong. Or, you know, but to see how, um, how I can do something that can help them. Yes, so very nice that you're cr critical of your own self and you're thinking how you can improve. You talk about especially dealing with people, that you want to be friendly with them. Of course, friendly to all living entities is not only people, but all forms of life. Yes, Maharaj. Yes. So? Yeah. Um, often times I find that it is easy to be friendly with uh, animals because uh, they come from a very innocent perspective. <laughs> uh, but uh, we try to think people, they have, you know, they're thinking of this, they're thinking of that. And uh, so that kind of comes as a barrier. So I think I should get out of that. Um, okay. Dealing with people is more of a challenge, yes. Yes. And many times I think I put thoughts, you know, I think they're thinking like this, I think they're doing this because they want to pull me down or, you know, they don't like me or something like that. So I want to get rid of that mental block because when dealing with animals, we don't have that because they just do what they're doing. So it's easy to uh, just be up, up straightforward with them. But with people, uh, I have, I think I have this difficulty and I want to overcome that. Very nice. Thank you. Very nice of you to share your plans. Hare yes. Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. I will try. I am Sundarananda Das from Bali. Okay, Prabhu. Yeah. So, uh, for me, in the, the qualities in, the interesting for me is the tolerance and mercy. So, tolerance means uh, tolerance from uh, outside uh, difficulties and also from our own uh, self, like uh, some many uh, desires for material enjoyment, like that. we try to tolerate that. Even in our life, that my experience in life of devotees also, we have to be tolerant also. There are some, sometimes there are many criticism or uh, jealousy, something like that. So we have to tolerate that. And mercy means that we, even in such so many difficulty, we have to try to uh, doing good to the devotees and doing service to the devotees or to the people, to the family, like that. And, and the next quality is for hearing and chanting. This is very important. If we just continue to doing this uh, chanting and, and hearing and chanting of the activities of the Supreme Lord, uh, hearing and chanting holy name and Srimad Bhagavatam in the association of the devotees like that. So they will helping and develop, developing in our uh, consciousness and our journey of our Krishna consciousness good like that. Oh, so you you understand that by good hearing and chanting it will help you to develop these qualities of tolerance and mercy. Yes, 
All, all the good qualities come by developing your devotion to Krishna. In the course of your devotion to Krishna, the other good qualities will automatically follow. Hmm? Yes, Maharaj. Like that. So you want to put more emphasis on good hearing and chanting. Or, okay, thank you, Prabhu. Yes, somebody else has their hand up? Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Sita Chakrani Devi uh, I My voice is coming. Yes, I can hear you. Um, I've just mentioned two qualities, Karunika, Mercy to and devote, staunch devotional service to the Lord without deviation. These two I want to develop. So merciful, we can uh, just have read in Bhagavatam, it, there is two types of mercy, material mercy and uh, spiritual mercy. And when we contact with devotional, uh, devotion services or good devotees, then we can understand to what is the real mercy. Shri Prabhupada told in Bhagavad Gita 2.1 when the mercy towards the soul is more important. So through learning and chanting and associating with those devotees who have developed this quality, I can get some idea to develop mercy in me. And second is, same is that devotional service to the Lord without deviation. This attracts me very much because without deviation, you can say that and Bhagavad Gita said that Vivasat me kabuti. And uh, Bhakti Vinod Thakur uh, refer Nirbandhani Mate. It is very important. So, by those devotees have developed this quality. When we serve them, when we associate them, and when we hear about them, what the qualities, about the Bhagavatam character, then we can develop some little bit quality. Okay. Little bit. Yes. Thank you. So, mercy and this undeviated devotional service. Nice qualities to develop, yes, and your plan is by the association of devotees who have these qualities, you will also develop them. Association is very important, yes, very, very valuable. You get good, strong association, you can also cultivate the similar qualities. And by hearing also, as you say, from Srimad Bhagavatam, we can also be inspired more in our Krishna consciousness, developing mercy and being fixed in our devotional service. All right, thank you. Yes, anybody else like to contribute? What about? Let's hear from some man. Yes. Very, very interesting. Since the uh, Lord and his devotees are uh, Suruddha, and nobody else is Suruddha in this world, material world. Not only not Suruddha, they are Puruddha. So, all connections should be disconnected, disconnected. Whether family is not devotee, and all relations, friendly acquaintances are not devotee. All relations should be disconnected and uh, all time should be spent for Lord and His devotees. And they only kill our time. Those who are not devotee and our friend, relations, they exploit us, they kill our time, which is is most valuable and should be spent, and this is possible, this is very much possible. So you have to take it seriously and act accordingly. In addition to what the politics already discussed, uh, 
also we should develop these qualities and it is possible. Which, is which particular qualities you're talking about? To renounce all other connection with uh, friends and uh, family if not their devotee. We have to disconnect it, uh, connection with them. For the sake of Lord Krishna and his devotees. Oh. Okay, that's a, a drastic step. <laughs> For the sake of Krishna, you're going to give up everything. Those who are not connected to Krishna. Yes, Prabhupada said if, if, the, if the family are not favorable, if they're not helpful, not conducive to Krishna consciousness, then you may have to leave the home. Not abruptly, but after some time. Just like Srila Prabhupada, he was a, a family man and he was at home and he had his children and he had business for some time. But somehow the business failed and then things didn't go very well and then the family life also deteriorated. The mood in the family was not good. And even his own books went missing. His own copies of the scriptures had gone missing. He wondered where they could have gone. And he suspected that somebody had taken them and sold them to get money. So he understood the home was not very pleasant. But he, he didn't do it abruptly. It was only after a lot of thought and a lot of time and, of course, when Prabhupada left home, he was already elderly. He was not a young man. And he had retired from work. He was not doing the business anymore, so he was at home. But he understood it was appropriate. It was time for him to leave the home. So sometimes, and when Prabhupada left home, you know, children had grown up. They were not young anymore, they were all grown up, most of them were married. And so Prabhupada's responsibility was pretty much over with. So like that, devotee is not irresponsible in giving up the family, but for the sake of taking up more service to Krishna, then one can leave the family. You don't want to be markata vairagya. You don't want to be renounced like a monkey. Monkeys also renounce, but you know, they have so much. Their renunciation is for sense gratification. We don't want to be renounced like monkeys. We want to be yukta vairagya. Renunciation in relation to Krishna. Lord Chaitanya gave up a young wife but he took more responsibility to deliver the world. If he had stayed at home, he can only deliver the family. But he went out from the home to deliver the world. So we don't run away from responsibility, but to take up more service to Krishna, we may give up things which are a hindrance to our devotional life. Okay? Is that all right with you, Prabhu? Do you agree with this? Okay. We'll just take one more question. Is, is there another hand up there? Ma Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Maharaji. Yeah. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, go ahead. Yes, this is Sakhi Priya Devidasi. Uh -huh. So, yeah, the qualities that I am inspired and would like to develop in me is first is Titikshava and uh, then Suhruta and Ajata Shatra and uh, another quality is non-deviation from, uh, from from the spiritual path, from devotional path because I understand that uh, uh, devotional service is unique that it is practiced in association of devotees and while we are associating with devotees because of our own immat immaturity uh, sometimes we try to uh, get into some troubles 
and maybe we are hurt by someone someone else and uh, we carry those feelings in our hearts so uh, for for these things i would like to develop more tolerance and also the quality of uh, ajat shatru because as uh, chetana mahaprabhu um, explained in the shikshashtakam that without uh, without with the feeling of without even caring for respect or if someone gives you respect or someone doesn't give you respect man or apman in all the situation uh, one has to continue with the devotional service thinking that and also with this idea with this uh, understanding that as i am connected to krishna the other soul is also connected to krishna so i uh, would like to develop these qualities uh, with uh, with the feeling of ajat shatru with the, no feeling of of vengeance towards anyone even if uh, in the circumstances of wrong doings and develop the quality of kindness so that we can reach out to more and more people and try to spread this message the uh, serve the mission of shri prabhupada and chaitanya mahaprabhu and in any adverse uh, scenario because bhakti when if all the situations are favorable it's very uh, joyful to uh, to perform devotional service but this moment this situation turns unfavorable sometimes our heart becomes a little bitter there's bitterness that develops so in what situation we are uh, krishna puts us or we are put by maya or by our own karmic uh, actions reactions whatever the situation may be to not deviate from the path of uh, devotional service so these are the qualities of the sadhus which i appreciate um, a lot and i they inspire me and i plan to develop these qualities in me by the mercy and blessings of all the devotees hari krishna how how do you plan to develop these qualities by constantly uh, being in touch with uh, with uh, bhagavad gita and bhagavatam that is what is my experience being that uh, while teaching uh, while preaching uh, the message of bhagavad gita or while studying bhagavatam uh, there is a connection we feel that yes i am connect i am being association of pure devotees of the lord and there is a kind of uh, um, uh, it it actually causes some kind of uh, reformation in me so constantly hearing and associating with pure devotees their instructions by uh, the instructions of guru maharaj dr prabhupad this is what i i i mean that i i can start develop uh, good qualities by a constant association of pure devotees all right thank you very much yes certainly association with the devotees very crucial reading the books is good but even more important is to get the association of the senior devotees because the senior devotees they will prabhu pad said they will pull our ear they will pull pull our ear to get us to come up to their level to do better to enhance our devotional qualities so just read the books on our own that's all right but when the de pure devotee is there watching us and pushing us getting us to do that's much more powerful so that personal association very important all right we'll go ahead uh, and more qualities uh, lord lord kapila is describing more about the sadhu the nature of their activities he spoke about the the internal qualities now we we'll hear a bit more about his actual activities engaging in devotional service without deviation many of you mentioned several of you mentioned that quality you were inspired by that and for the sake of the lord he renounces all other connections such as family relationships friendly acquaintances and so one of the devotees was also inspired in that way also giving up whoever is not in relation to krishna consciousness Fa family can be a great boost to our krishna consciousness but it can also be a problem if they if they are not krishna conscious if they don't have the interest so family life is not eternal we come together for some time more activities engage constantly in chanting and hearing about me the supreme personality of godhead the sadhus do not suffer from material miseries because they are always filled 
with thoughts of my pastimes and activities. Sometimes people are surprised, they think the life of the devotee must be very difficult. Oh, very difficult, very miserable. You wake up so early in the morning and you go to the temple and you do all the chanting. They, th they think, oh, it must be so difficult. And to go traveling and preaching also, so difficult. People are not interested. But the devotee doesn't think it's so difficult. Devotees, it, for the devotee is blissful. Sadhus don't suffer material miseries. They're not in the bodily consciousness. Although it may appear, appears to materialistic people, it may appear difficult. But for the devotee, it's not difficult. The devotee is happy, joyful, remembering Krishna. Prabhupada's purport, text 24, we have to seek the association of such devotees, right? Such devotees, sadhus. For this reason, we had begun the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. There are many mercantile, scientific and other associations in human society to develop a particular type of education or consciousness. But there is no association that helps one to get free from all material association. So much education is there. So many in ed educational institutes are there, but Krishna Consciousness is giving this unique education to get us free from material association. Everything else, the education is to get more entangled in material association. We become more entangled in the material world. Krishna Conscious education is to get us free. So this is the real purpose, Krishna Consciousness. We're not worried about all these other things. Then the very important verse, very famous verse, comes up in this, this chapter. This uh, verse describing the activities of the devotees when they come together. Satam prasanga mama virya sambhido bhavanti ritkarana rasayana pita. Rasayana, Rasayana, Prabhupada explains the word Rasayana, it means taste, just like when you eat food, taste. It's all the same way, topics of Krishna, they're Rasayana for the karna, the ears, and the, rit, the heart, the ear and the heart, they take pleasure, they're getting satisfaction, just like the hungry man who eats food, he feels pleasure, relief from hunger. So the devotees, the topics of Lord Krishna in the association of devotees, very pleasing. And what is the result? That shradharatir bhaktir anukramishyati, shrad, you get shrad, right? Shrad meaning faith, that faith means actually asakti, becoming fully attached to Krishna Consciousness. And Rati, that, that attachment, that is actually Bhava. And Bhakti, that is Prima. So, Asakti, Bhava, Prima, Anukramishiti. They come one after another. By doing proper hearing and chanting. It will depend on the quality of our hearing and chanting, how much effect we get. Everything depends on the attitude. We have to have the right mood. We will hear how there's devotional service in the modes. So, if we do our hearing and chanting in the mode of ignorance, we cannot expect to get the real benefit. But when we do it very carefully, very seriously, then 
these things come about one after another. All right, so just want to examine the process of bhakti and the stages that we go through here. Only by association with devotees does the mind develop attraction to the Lord. The stages are described here. Right? We've got the association. Now we have to make use of, we've got to make sure the mind also becomes attracted. The previous verse mentioned that association should be desired, right? We should want association. Then faith arises. And then the quality of one's association with devotees is not so good. Then there is bhajana kriya. But my pastimes do not become nectar. From excellent association, my past times become nectar. So, so it depends on the quality of the association. And the quality of the association will depend on both parties, both the hearer and the chanter. The audience have to be qualified, just as the speaker has to be qualified. You need the qualified audience. We have to be really willing to hear. Then, you get the benefit. By regularly hearing, one attains nishta. All right? With nityam Bhagavata Sevaya. Regularly hearing the Bhagavatam. We have to hear the Bhagavatam regularly, then we get the real benefit. Some people they do the Bhagavat Sapta seven days and then finish. And some people do Bhakti Vaibhav. And after Bhakti Vaibhav, then they put aside Srimad Bhagavatam. They think, oh, I've done all, I did all that, I've studied. <laughs> I don't need to hear. No, we have to hear regularly. Narrations give realization. We start to understand more. These topics produce ruchi, pleasing to the ear and the heart. Right? You got, we, have, we have to develop this taste, ruchi, taste. From the taste, then asakti, and then bhava, they appear one after the other, and then finally prima. So this is of the stages of the devotional service. You've studied this before in Bhakti Shastri, the different stages we go through in developing prema, coming to prema bhakti. So then Devahuti's got more questions. She wants to know, what kind of devotional service would be suitable for me to immediately attain your lotus feet? That's a good desire. She wants immediately. That's an important thing. What do I have to, I want to get this immediately. I want to get it once. I don't want to wait. It shouldn't take a long time. I want it immediately. I want to taste it now. Is it so easy to get everything immediately? It's going to take some time. Devotees would also say like that to Prabhupada, that we want to get it quick, Prabhupada, give us quick, tell us everything. It takes a little time, you have to be patient. What is the mystic yoga system that completely ends material existence and leads to the ultimate goal? So Devahuti is a very good student, she's got nice questions, she wants to understand, she wants to end material existence. And ending material existence means you don't come back again. You get out of the material world, we don't want to come back. Just like when we come to Krishna consciousness, we don't want to give up Krishna consciousness. We want to remain in Krishna consciousness. We've seen so many devotees come and go. It's so unfortunate. Prabhupada was also 
upset. He said, we spent, we shed so much blood to make one devotee and take so many years to train them and then they go away. It's so sad. Uh, Bhakti Vaigyan Maharaj from Russia, he did a study on the devotees in Russia and he found out that the average lifespan of a devotee in Russia is eight years. That after eight years, they've had enough Krishna consciousness, they don't want to do it anymore, they give it up. It's not good. But Devahuti said she wants to completely end material existence. That should be the mood. We come to Krishna consciousness, this is for life. We're not going back to the material world. We don't want to give up. We want to get the goal, the ultimate goal, to come, come to Krishna. So how many ways can we understand that yoga? Are there different paths or is only one way? How many ways Devahuti wants to know? What type of bhakti is suitable to you? And what is possible for a person like me by which I can attain your feet full of bliss? Some bhakti may be good for one person. What about other people? Some people will really do sankirtan, some people do deity worship, some people do cooking, some people do cleaning. Different methods, different ways of bhakti. Some people are hearing and others are chanting, somebody is doing smaranam, somebody is doing dashyam, we you know nine paths of bhakti. So these answers are given, you can make a note, the answer to this question comes in verses 31 to 44, Lord Kapila answers what kind of bhakti is suitable. And then question 3, Devahuti asks, what is the jnana by which one understands tattvas? Asked in verse number 29, and that's answered in chapters 26 and 27. Right? Tomorrow we'll look at chapter 26 and the next day chapter 27. So we'll answer this question, what is the jnana by which one understands tattvas? Question 4. What is the yoga mentioned by which one is aimed at the Lord for liberation? How many limbs does it have? And this is answered in chapter number 28. So you can see the different chapters are all relating to, this, to questions put here by Devahuti. Questions all put in 29. She talks about the, the arrows, right? what she was asking. What is the yoga mentioned by you which is aimed at the Lord for liberation? So the aim, like an arrow, here. Bhakti yoga is just like an arrow, aiming up to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The aim, the goal, Lord Sri Krishna, this banna or arrow is so sharp and swift, it goes directly to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, penetrating the regions of impersonal Brahman and localized Paramatma. Right? This is Bhagavat Banna. The Bhagavat Manna, the arrow of devotion to the Supreme Lord. We, we don't want impersonal Brahman realization or localized Paramatma realization. We want to go directly to the Supreme Lord, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That's what we want. We have to get that. So coming back, Maitreya speaking, he's been narrating to Vidura. So 
he describes, after hearing the statement of his mother, Kapila could understand her purpose and he became compassionate towards her because of being born of her body. He described the Sankhya system of philosophy, which is a combination of devotional service and mystic realization as received by disciplic succession. Prabhupada describes the Sankhya philosophy like this, a combination of devotional service and mystic realization. We will hear about the mystic realization. It comes by Gyan and by the Astanga Yoga also, the meditation. So the, com the combination is there. But it through disciplic succession, there is a disciplic succession. It's not just some manufacture. It, it's coming from Lord Kapila himself and passed down. Lord Kapila describes, we were speaking about the, the aim, the Supreme Lord, right? So how to achieve that? The senses are symbolic representations of the demigods. Different senses are all influenced by the different demigods, under the control of different demigods. The eyes, there's a demigod controlling the eyes, the powers of the different senses, the nose, and, uh, there's so many different demigods, huh? 33 crore demigods. So these demigods all have different functions, controlling the different senses. Their natural inclination is to work under the direction of the Vedic injunctions. The natural inclination. But we're not natural, we're conditioned. But the natural in inclination is to follow the Vedic instructions. As the senses are representatives of the demigods, so the mind is the representative of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The mind, the king of the senses, so the mind is controlling these different senses, it's the representative of the Supreme Lord. And the mind's natural duty is to serve. So, pointing out this spirit of devotional service is far better than mukti, liberation. People talk about liberation, but the real goal of life is not just to get liberation. You can take a few minutes to just look for some reasons how bhakti is superior to yoga and mukti. You can look at these verses, 32, 33, 34, and then 36 and 41. Please take a few minutes to just look through these verses and come up with some quotes telling us how bhakti is far better than mukti.
we got some quotes? Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna. Can I say a quote? Yes, please. Please accept my humble obeisance, please. Okay. It is said to the purport in verse number um, 32 that Bhakti, the inclination to serve the Supreme Personality of Godhead, is in a transcendental position far better than Mukti. Bhakti is a stage after liberation. Unless one is liberated, one cannot engage the senses in the service of the Lord. And when the senses are engaged in the serve, when the sense, sorry, when the senses are engaged either in material activity of sense gratification or in the activity of Vedic injunctions, there is some motive. But when the senses are engaged in the service of the Lord, there is no motive. Very good. When the the mind without being deviated is fully engaged in Krishna consciousness or devotional service that is far better than aspiration for liberation. Yes. Thank you. Very nice quotes. Yes. The superior position of bhakti over liberation. The impersonalist, for the impersonalist, liberation is the goal. But for the devotee, our devotion begins on the liberated platform. We have, to, we have to be on that liberated platform to actually serve Krishna. We have to have transcended the modes of nature to really engage in service. All right, some other quotes? Hare Krishna Maharaj, in Jesus of Amal Obeisances, in text number 33, um, there is an analogy of the uh, fire in the stomach that digests everything that we eat. Uh, we don't have to do any separate endeavor. So similarly, uh, Prabhupada explains in the purport that uh, uh, simply by uh, engaging in devotional service, we automatically get liberation. And uh, he also quotes Bilo Mangal Thakur, uh, in um, where Bilo Mangal Thakur is saying that if I have unflinching devotion to the lotus feet of the Supreme Lord, then mukti or liberation serves me as my maid servant, uh, and she is always ready to do whatever I ask. Oh, very good. Yes, very clear quote. Yes, thank you, Prabhu. Very nice. I like this example fire in the stomach digests everything. <laughs> so, how does this relate to bhakti? Just by chanting Hare Krishna, we don't need to uh, think how the liberation uh, works or uh, just as uh, we eat and then we don't have to think how it's getting digested inside the stomach. So simply by engaging in devotion service, we can get automatically liberated. That's mm -hmm. my understanding. Okay. Thank you, Prabhu. Yes. All right. So, someone else? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. This is Pantap Sakhi Maharaj. Am I audible? Yes, very clear. 
Yes, Maharaj, in verse number 34, uh, Prabhupada mentions that the devotee does not uh, aspire for any type of merging into the Supreme Lord, which is called Ekatma. And uh, the devotee always engages in the greater pleasure, which is the serving the, through the devotional services, which is a greater pleasure than merging into his existence. Because the greatest pleasure is to serve the Lord. The devotee is always thinking about how to serve him and the design ways and means to serve the Supreme Lord, even in the midst of greatest obstacles of material existence. So that was my understanding, Maharaj. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Okay. This service to the Lord, superior to all other activities. Right? Have we got some more quotes? Anything? Krishna Maharaj. Yes. This is Leela Mai Rukmini Devi Dasi. Um, Prabhupada says here, the impersonalist has to undergo severe penances and austerities to attain mukti, but the bhakta, simply by engaging himself in the bhakti process, especially in chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, immediately develops control over the tongue by engaging it in chanting and by accepting the remnants of food stuff offered to the personality of Godhead. As soon as the tongue is controlled naturally, all other senses are automatically controlled. Sense control is the perfection of the yoga principle and one's liberation begins immediately as soon as he engages himself in the service of the Lord. It is confirmed by Kapila Deva that bhakti or devotional service is gariyasi, more glorious than siddhi or liberation. Okay, yes. Hare Krishna. Devotional service is so simply performed. Uh, just chant Hare Krishna, take prasadam, the senses are controlled. Prabhupada would say this Krishna consciousness movement is a system of recreation only. Just simply recreation, chanting and dancing and taking prasada. And simply by doing these things, we, come, we can become so advanced. Other processes, they make advancement with great difficulty, so much trouble. Lord Krishna himself says in the Bhagavad Gita, that they make advancement with great difficulty, so much trouble to try to give up the material because they have no shelter, they have no link with the Supreme Lord. So for them it's so much trouble, but for the devotees without even thinking about it, they don't even notice. We give the example, you go in the lift, you go in the lift, immediately you come up to the top of the building. You just press the button. But the other process is you walk up the stairs, make advancement so slowly, so much trouble. All right, some more quote? Hare Krishna Maharaj, this is Murti Sri. Yes. Uh, this is the text 36. Uh -huh. uh, Seeing the charming forms of the Lord, smiling and attractive, and hearing his very pleasing words, the pure devotee almost loses all other consciousness. His senses are freed from all other engagements, and he becomes absorbed in devotional service. Thus, in spite of his unwillingness, he attains liberation without separate endeavor. Mm. Hare Krishna. So Prabhupada talks about the, the smiling form. So, what's being referred to here? Who are these smiling forms? I guess it is a meditation. It does concentrate on the smiling forms of the Lord. We simply meditate like that and we get liberated naturally. Oh, and what about he speaks to you? We need not go through difficult meditations. I think also the indication is deities. There's some indication, not only the meditation, but also worshipping deities. Ha, deity worship, that is. Deity worship. Yes. The smiling form of the Lord. When you go, we go and see the deities, and we can, you can understand how the Lord is pleased with you or not. 
Is the deity smiling at you or not? If the deity... Hmm? Feel satisfied internally also. The much we serve, keep on serving the deities, or much we do the bhakti, five forms of bhakti, we get satisfied internally also. Yes. You know, we, we the, as devotees, we, we want to give more attention to worshipping the Lord in the deity form. We don't just simply meditate on the Lord in the heart. But we like to have the deity, the personal form of the Lord, and give service. And Prabhupada, or it's how we, the devotee, the deity sometimes talks to the devotee. There will be messages coming from the deity, instructions. Sometimes this communication is there between the Lord and his devotee. If we just meditate on the Lord in the heart, we may also get instruction from the heart. But this is not the usual process in Bhakti Yoga. We give more importance to the worship of the deity, worshipping the deity, and the deity communicates with the devotee. We're, we're not like the others, you know, the, the smartas, Smarter people, smarter people, they worship murtis. They don't think of the Lord as actually being present in the form of the, the, the in, in, in the figure, in the, in the object of worship. But we understand that the object of worship is transcendental and the Lord is personally manifest there within that form. So we can directly visualize the form of the Lord and we can communicate with the Lord through that deity form. And the Lord also communicates with the devotee. We get instructions. Sometimes see the Lord is smiling and sometimes he's not. It will depend, of course, how we are reciprocating, how we are serving the Lord. But the, as the devotee progresses, he will develop more that kind of relationship with the Lord. Communication. Like Madhavendra Puri, he got instruction. Gopal told him how he was under the, he'd been hidden under the Govardhan hill. And he asked Madhavendra Puri to come and take him out from the hill. So Madhavendra Puri got help and they, they dug up and they found the deity in the Govardhan hill. And they established that deity and began the worship of the deity. All right, is, any other quotes here? We didn't get uh, anything? Uh, yeah, 41, anything? Yeah, 41. Without the surrendering process, one cannot achieve liberation. The Bhagavatam says, those who are simply popped up thinking themselves liberated by some non-devotional process are not polished or clear in the intelligence for they have to yet surrender on to you. In spite of executing all kind of austerity and penance or even arriving at the brink of a spiritual realization in Brahma realization, they think that they are in the intelligence of Brahma. But actually, because they have no transcendental activities, they fall down to the material activity. So one should not be satisfied simply with the knowing that one is Brahma. He must engage himself in the service of the Supreme Brahma, that is Bhakti. Oh, yes, right. They don't know the, the, the impersonalists or the smartas, Mayavadis, they don't understand what is spiritual activity. They don't know. They don't understand. So they think to give up everything, to stop everything, to do nothing, to go away from the world. So their renunciation is like that. It is denial of activity. They cannot understand that there can be such things as transcendental activity. 
There can be transcendental forms, transcendental activities. That is unknown to them. But devotees know very clearly about transcendental activities. Devotional service is above the modes, it's transcendental. But the, for the Maya, they're thinking all activity, oh, it's all Maya, all talking, Maya, all activity, Maya. They're thinking, even our chanting, Maya. Everything is illusion, only there's a oneness. And they want to negate everything, not this, not this, not that, stop everything. So this is unnatural. And, they're, they're, and the result of their renunciation is simply frustration. And they go back to the material life again. They go back to the material world. Prabhupada explains so many big yogis, mayavadis, they were very renounced. And then they come back and they open, a, they open a school or they open a hospital or they open an old people's home or they do something mundane, something, they have no knowledge, spiritual activities. They don't know how to, what is actually transcendental activity. So Krishna conscious devotees, they're always engaged in transcendental activities. We're always active in the service of Krishna. So in this way Bhakti Yoga is certainly superior to Mukti. Alright? So we'll go ahead. Another quote here, text 44. Therefore persons whose minds are fixed on the Lord engage in the intensive practice of devotional service. That is the only means for attainment of the final perfection of life. Fix the mind on the Lord. This is the final perfection of life that we can fully absorb ourselves. How do we fix our mind on the Lord? By intensive devotional service. Hearing, chanting, remembering, worshipping, offering prayers. Like that, nine Navanga Bhakti. Text 44 purport, first of all the mind should be engaged at the lotus feet of the Lord, very steadily and naturally, because the mind is a master of the senses. When the mind is engaged, all the senses become engaged. That is Bhakti Yoga. Just like Maharaj Ambarish, the famous verse describing Maharaj Ambarish's activities, Savaimana Krishna Parara Vindayor Vachamsi Vaikunta Gunana Varnane. Like this, Maharaj Ambarishi's activities are described how he used all of his senses in the service of the Lord. The very first thing he did was to fix his mind on the lotus feet of Krishna. We were just studying in the sixth canto, we were studying about Vrita Sura. And Vritasura was fighting uh, Indra, and Vritasura is telling Indra to kill him. He said, come on, kill me, you've got that thunderbolt weapon Lord Vishnu gave you, told you about the thunderbolt weapon, you can use it to kill me. Because Vritasura knew that when he's killed, he's going to go back to Godhead. So, he's not just telling Indra to kill him, but he's also fixing his mind on the Lord. He, said, he, he was preparing for his death because his mind was absorbed in thinking of Lord Sankarshan. He was a devotee of Sankarshan and so he fixed his mind on the lotus feet of Lord Sankarshan. So that when Indra kills him, he can get this, he can go where he, go back to Godhead. The mind has to be fixed. Bhishma, similarly Grandfather Bhishma was on his bed of arrows and uh, we know Lord Krishna came there, Maharaj Yudhisthira, and Bhishma sp spoke for many days on many different subject matters. And finally it came time for the auspicious time for Bhishma Dev to leave the body. And so he stopped all the speaking 
and he just concentrated solely on Lord Krishna. Nothing else. He just concentrated solely on Lord Krishna and remembering Lord Krishna's pastimes, remembering Lord Krishna coming before him when they were fighting and how he was firing arrows into the body of Lord Krishna and the wounds on Lord Krishna's body. And he saw Lord Krishna run before him holding the chariot wheel. He was going to throw the chariot wheel on Bhishma. And he was remembering the Lord and all his wonderful dealings. So like that, this is bhakti yoga. You fix the mind, you use the mind. Not that you just, oh, think of Krishna and then well, how to think of Krishna, oh, I don't know. <laughs> no, we have to... We have to hear about Krishna, we have to absorb our mind in remembering his wonderful qualities and pastimes. Okay, that's the end of the PowerPoint presentation. Have we got any questions on the chapter? Hare Krishna, please accept my humble obeisances. Myself, Purna Pranya Keshudas. I have a question uh, regarding this context. Like um, we are uh, saying the uh, superiority of bhakti over yoga and mystic. And in bhakti also we have a lot of struggles in Anathnavriti and it may take some lifetimes also to purify us. So, but uh, that is one question. Next question is that how, what is the blocking for the mystics, that is yoga practitioners uh, to take up the bhakti, the other two uh, divisions? Because they are, they are also doing a lot of hard work. It seems that bhakti is a cakewalk. That I know, just like that you go go to the Lord. Seems like that. Could you please elaborate? Thank you, Maharaj. Well, the, the obstacle for the bhakt, the obstacle for mystics to come to bhakti, actually in mystic yoga there also has to be some element of bhakti. There has to be some element in everything. But we emphasize, we put the emphasis on bhakti. Our concentration is solely on bhakti. They have a little bhakti, but they have so many other things also deviating their minds. They're not just emphasizing only bhakti. Their process is more on the meditation and the jnana and like that. Maybe also worshipping many deities. So they could, they could also do bhakti if they wanted, but because they're, they're, sometimes they feel this bhakti yoga is just some sentimental process. The chanting and the, the dancing, they think this is just some emotional show, this is not really spiritual. They don't think it's so, they don't think, they don't see much renunciation. They don't consider that, you know, the, oh, bhakti yoga, these people, they're just all, you know, everything is so easy for them, singing, dancing. And then they have all the ladies there as well, and the men are there, you know, it's not so renounced as the, these other, the mystics are. The mystics, their hearts become very hard and they become very attached to dry renunciation. Dry renunciation and dry knowledge. So, for them to come to bhakti, how to bring the, these mystics into bhakti? Needs the, the mercy of a devotee. How did any of us come to bhakti? We all need the mercy of a devotee. Doesn't matter where you come from, what background, what fa society, what family you come from, you have to have the mercy of a devotee. And so we have to somehow give mercy to these people. And in Kali Yuga, how to give mercy? It's not so easy to discuss philosophy with them. Philosophy, Lord Chaitanya could speak present philosophy to the Mayavadis in Benares, Lord Chaitanya spoke very basically about the philosophy of Vedanta to Prakasananda Saraswati when they met in Benares. But we can expect, we cannot expect that we have the potency of Lord Chaitanya. We, but we can, 
give prasada and we can give the chanting of the holy name. So these two things are very powerful, the chanting of the holy name and spiritual foodstuff. When Prabhupada would meet with big scientists, Prabhupada was very, very concerned, give them very nice prasada. And as they would eat prasada, they would become more and more favourable. So kirtan and prasada, very powerful in changing the hearts and bringing people to Krishna consciousness. They have, they have their own ideas, they have their own idea what is spiritual. Our, we don't have ideas, we're simply following parampara. Everything is authorised by scriptures. In the Kali Yuga, the process is the chanting of the holy name. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maharaj. But uh, this point is that we may be introduced to the process of bhakti, but you know the the result it takes a long way to go. Just to, you hear this uh, context that just by seeing the deities in the temple, we may sometimes Krishna may be smiling at us. We may have such feelings and reciprocations, but uh, but at the same time, some other modes of nature we also get uh, uh, covered by the modes of material nature. And uh, it due to in other cases like Anathas takes many lifetimes also. So how do we uh, describe that part? Well, we have to come up to the mode of goodness. We have to really focus on that. If we are influenced by the modes, we have to get free of that passion and ignorance. We have to recognize that the how that passion and ignorance is de degrading us and bringing, causing us to manifest bad qualities. You have to remove these influences of passion and ignorance, come up to the mode of pure goodness. And then we can go on, go on from there. So we have to recognize what's a fall down. The fall down is when we become over lusty and over angry and over passionate. We have to get rid of these things these anartas, the unwanted things in the heart, purifying the heart. So the process of bhakti is very effective to do that, to remove all these things which are there in the heart. It doesn't have to take a long time. It doesn't have to take a long time. It's up to us how much are we willing to really commit ourselves to this process. Are we trying to hold on? to some material things, we're, we're trying to hold, are we very attached to this material world? It depends on our own attitude. Prabhupada writes, Nectar of Instruction, everything depends on the attitude. What is our attitude in performing devotional service? So we have to really be sure that we're really putting our whole heart and soul into these devotional activities. And then you get the desired result. It really doesn't have to take a long time. We have seen, we see many devotees, they come to Krishna consciousness and very quickly they can become very good devotees, very strong, very steady in Krishna consciousness. They don't have to know a lot. They don't have to know many things. They have to use what they know. That's important. It's not that we have to be big scholars of Vedanta or anything, but we have to use what we know. We have to be, we have to have some realization. And Krishna can give that. As we surrender, Krishna reveals. So that's my feelings. Okay. Any other Hare question? Krishna. Yes. Sorry, Hare Krishna Maharaj, Tanda Pranam, Yadraj Chira. Yes, Maharaj, sir. how one uh, comes uh, elevate from uh, Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti to, to the level of Bhava Bhakti or Raghunaga Bhakti? Well, from Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti, we have to come to Raghunaga Bhakti. Yes, how Maharaj? Just simply by 
being, by doing very good Vaidhisadhana Bhakti, by practicing Vaidhisadhana Bhakti, we will naturally come to the, it will become naturally, it will turn to Raganuga Bhakti. The mood of devotion will become more spontaneous, that will become more naturally attracted. Just like we give the example in the beginning, waking up in the morning can be difficult. In the beginning, when you're first a devotee, you need a clock and you can't get up so well. But gradually, after you've been a devotee a little while, then you wake up naturally, without a clock, without anybody calling you. Naturally, you get up. Eagerly, you're up. Long before Mongol RT, you've had a shower, you've even chanted rounds before Mongol RT. Like that. So this, but our devotional service is becoming more Raganuga Bhakti. We're developing more taste for the hearing and the chanting. We have less and less attraction for the material world. That is the sign that we're developing Raganuga Bhakti. All the elements are already there. You don't have to have any new elements to develop Raganuga Bhakti. It's all there within our Krishna consciousness movement. All the songs we sing, songs about Krishna's pastimes and Lord Chaitanya's pastimes, and worshipping the deities, everything is there for Raganuga Bhakti. We don't need any new elements. We just have to be very conscious, do everything with great devotion, follow it, do everything nicely, and we will develop that. It comes. One of, the big thing, Anartha Nivriti. Getting through the Anartha Nivriti. You want to get to the higher level? You want to come to Bhava and Prema Bhakti? We have to get through Anartha Nivriti. We have to get rid of the Anarthas. So Lord Balaram or Lord Nityananda, they're very powerful. They can help us. They're the original Guru and they can help us to overcome this Ridaya Durbhavyam, the weakness in the heart. Weakness in the heart, this attachment to sense gratification. So we're coming up to Nityananda Triodasi in a couple of days. Pray to Lord Nityananda to help us to get through all these anarthas so that we can really focus on our bhakti and we can develop. The elements of bhava, they're described also. You read your nectar of devotion, there's nine different elements of bhakti, the different thing, qualities which we should be developing. This is coming, this, when, the more we have developed these qualities, the more we have come to bhava bhakti. Bhava bhakti, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be trembling and shedding tears all the time. Some ecstatic symptoms, they may come, they may not. That's not important. But the element that eagerness, the natural attraction for Krishna's service, that has to be there. That will be there. And Baba is the seed of Prem. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. I have one uh, question regarding uh, while we were going through this, these, uh, the, the section, the 25th chapter. There is one. Uh, uh, one statement that mind is a representation of the Supreme Lord. Now, uh, we learn in Bhagavad Gita that it is because of the activities of the mind that we get degraded and it is also because of the activity of the mind that we can be elevated. And also we learn that uh, intelligence is about mind. Then if intelligence is about the mind in the hierarchy, then how do we understand that mind is a representation of the Supreme Lord? Mm -hmm. Well, we have to understand the mind is controlling the senses. The mind is directing the senses, right? It's from the mind that the senses are being given instruction. The mind is compared to the Supreme Lord in the sense that the mind is controlling these senses. And these senses are under the they're Krishna's senses. They're meant to be used for Krishna's service. The Supreme Lord is directing. We say, Rishikesha, Rishikena, Sevanam, Bhakti, Ruchate. Krishna 
is Rishikesh, he's the proprietor of the senses. We're meant to use our senses in Krishna's service. So when the mind is compared to the Lord, it's a comparison in relation to the senses. And if the senses are demigods, then who's above the demigods? The Lord is above the dem. Who is above the senses? The mind is above the senses. Yeah, the intelligence is also there. Intelligence is a function of the mind. You can understand. The intelligence is next to the soul. And so the intelligence is coming. We get intelligence from the soul. And the intelligence is meant to guide the mind. How can we... They, in this example, they have not mentioned about the, the intelligence, have not mentioned about the soul. It's simply given a, a comparison, comparing the senses like that, the, the attraction, what, it was the, the arrow, right? The arrow, we have to aim the arrow at the Supreme Lord. So the mind has to be focused on the Lord. So to focus the mind on the Lord, that intelligence has to be there, and has to be there. The intel you could say, uh, I'll, wait, I'll, I'll have to look at my, my text again to, go, to think more about this question you've asked. It's a good question. I appreciate this question. Uh, maybe you leave it with me today and I'll look over it today and I'll get back to you tomorrow and try to give you a more satisfactory answer on this. Thank you. Yes, sure. Thank you, Maharaj. Yes, any other questions? No? Okay. So then we will stop here today? Yes, sure. Thank you very much. So we'll meet tomorrow. Do I see? Today is the courtesy there? Yes, Maharaj. All right. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. We do Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yes. Okay, so we'll see you to have a good courtesy. We'll see you tomorrow. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Thank you, 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 Maharaj.